Hey there, welcome back to another Mate Science Easy Physics lesson. In this lesson, we're going to be carrying on from what we did last lesson on forces. We're going to look at what force diagrams are and how to draw them, and what resultant forces are and how to calculate them. So a very quick reminder about forces acting in pairs. So we already know that all forces act in pairs. That means that single forces, forces on their own, cannot exist. So all forces must be a pair of either pushes or pulls or twists. And the pairs of forces must always act in the opposite direction to each other. So we have an action force here. We have a runner. So the runner is trying to run forwards. Now, the reaction force is that the ground pushes the runner forward. The action, the runner pushes on the ground. The reaction, the ground pushes the runner forward. So we have an action and a reaction. Now that might be triggering something that you know in your memory already about reactions and forces. So let's have a look at another example. We've got a rocket here. We have the action, the exhaust gases push down on the atmosphere. We have a reaction, the atmosphere pushes up on the rocket and the rocket accelerates upwards away from the ground. So we have a pair of forces acting in opposite directions. We have an action and a reaction. Something happens, the force pushes one way, the object moves the other way. So, this idea about actions and reactions and what's happening can be summed up very simply and we can say that anything exerting a force on another object will experience an equal force in the opposite direction. And this is known as Newton's third law of motion. And Newton's third law, you've probably heard this before, is to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So here with this example the action is the exhaust pushing down. It could be pushing down with 10,000 newtons of force for example. So that means the reactionary force has to push the rocket up with 10,000 newtons of force. Action and reaction. The reaction is in the opposite direction to the action and it is of the same magnitude as the action. So taking this into account we can draw diagrams to show forces and in fact you've already seen these over the last couple of lessons we just haven't called them force diagrams. So force diagrams show these pairs of forces and force diagrams show the magnitude and the direction of a force. So we've got a free faller, a parachutist, and we've seen this guy before. And we've also seen other force diagrams, we just haven't labelled them as that. So we know that forces must be in the opposite direction. So here, what we have happening is the Earth is pulling down the skydiver at a force of 800 newtons, because he has a mass of 80 kilograms. Now the skydiver is going to be pulling the earth up with a force of 800 newtons. So we have two forces, opposite directions, equal in magnitude. Now obviously the skydiver having a fairly small mass is going to be affected quite a lot by a force of 800 newtons. The earth being massive is not going to be affected at all by a force of 800 newtons acting on it. But we can see we have opposite forces, opposite directions, but equal magnitude. So there must always be an action and a reaction. So let's have a look at another example. So here we have an aeroplane. And we can see we've got our two forces in opposite directions. So we've got our pair of forces, that's good. But we can see the plane is being pushed forwards by the engines with a thrust of 110 kilonewtons. 
but the force pushing it backwards, the air resistance, is 130 kilonewtons. So this isn't a balanced force. And you might think, well, hang on a minute. This seems to be breaking Newton's third law because it says every action has an equal and opposite reaction. However, the forces in a force diagram do not always need to be balanced because when they're not balanced, changes are taking place. So the thrust on the engines is less than the air resistance, so the velocity of the plane will be decreasing. As the velocity of the plane decreases, the air resistance will also decrease and eventually our two forces will become balanced again. But what's interesting about this example of the plane is although we have a force from the engine pushing it forward and we have a force of air resistance pushing it backwards, there are other forces involved and there is another pair of forces involved keeping this plane in the air. And we have the force of gravity, of weight, pulling this plane down at about 40,000 kilonewtons, but we also have up thrust, the lift created by the wings, equal to that gravity of 40,000 newtons. So the altitude of this plane is going to remain constant. So the upward lift of the wings is equal to the downward pull of gravity. So there's gonna be no change to altitude here. So we can see in this particular example, we have two different pairs of forces acting upon this plane. Now, sometimes we need to calculate something known as resultant force. And resultant force essentially means overall force. And a resultant force is the difference between the two forces within a pair. So let's have a look at an example of a car. We have a forward force of a thousand newtons and a backwards force also of a thousand newtons a balanced force. And remember, if we have a balanced force, there are no changes. So the resultant force here, the overall force, is going to be 1,000 newtons minus 1,000 newtons. Our resultant force is zero newtons. Now, let's just think about that. There are no changes if forces are balanced. If forces are balanced, the resultant force, the overall force is zero newtons. Can a force of zero newtons of nothing cause a change? No, of course it can't. So this is why when we have balanced forces, there are no changes because there is no resultant force. There is actually no force acting on our object. So a resultant force of zero newtons means the forces are balanced. So we know there's no change to velocity, shape, or direction. But let's have a look at another example here. The forward force is 1,200 newtons. The backward force is 1,000 newtons. So the resultant force is 1,200 newtons minus 1,000 newtons. When calculating resultant force, you always take away the smaller number from the larger number. So here we're taking away 1,000, the smaller number, from 1,200, the larger number. So our resultant force is going to be 200 newtons forward. A resultant force other than zero newtons, anything at all above zero newtons, means that the forces are unbalanced. And there will be a change to velocity, direction, or shape. So this car essentially has the force of 200 newtons pushing it forward. So it's going to accelerate. It's going to have a change of velocity. Now let's have another look at calculating resultant force because it can sometimes be a bit more complicated. So here we have a mass on a spring. The downward force is seven newtons. The upward force is seven newtons. The resultant force is zero newtons. Seven minus seven is zero. If we have a smaller mass, the downward force is four newtons, the upward force is seven newtons. So we have a resultant force upwards of three newtons. Here, we've put two masses on the spring. So we have two downward forces of four newtons and one upwards force of seven newtons. 
Because the two downward forces are acting in the same direction, they add together. So, we have 4 plus 4, which is 8 newtons, minus 7 newtons, giving us a resultant force downwards of 1 newton. Now, forces and resultant forces link in to mass and acceleration. So force, mass and acceleration are all linked together. So resultant force is equal to the mass of something multiplied by its acceleration. Now this is known as Newton's second law of motion. And it can be summed up with F equals MA or force equals mass times acceleration. And we can put this into an equation triangle. Again, I'm not going to explain how to do this now. You should know. If you're not sure, go back to some of the first physics lessons and it's all explained there. So, we can calculate the rate an object should accelerate it if we know the force applied and the mass of an object. Or we could calculate the rate of acceleration if a force is applied to an object where we know its mass. So let's take an example here. We have a mass of one kilogram. So force, mass and acceleration. We know its mass is one kilogram. Now we're going to say that it's acting downwards. It's falling. So it has a force of 10 newtons pulling it down. And we know that the rate of acceleration in this case is 10 meters per second squared because it's gravity. So we have all of our information here. We know that one kilogram has a weight of 10 newtons. And we know that if something's falling, it has a rate of acceleration of 10 meters per second squared. So we can see here that force, mass and acceleration are all linked very clearly. Now, if we were to apply a force of one newton to this one kilogram mass, it would accelerate at one meter per second squared. If we were to apply a force of two newtons to something of two kilograms, it would accelerate at one meter per second squared. If we applied a force of four newtons to a mass of two kilograms, it would accelerate at two meters per second squared. So, Force, mass, and acceleration are linked. Now, this relationship is really, really important because it doesn't always seem that obvious. When you look at it with simple numbers like this, it becomes quite clear. So, let's just take the example where we have a force of 4 newtons applied to an object of 2 kilograms. Acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. 4 divided by 2 is 2. Of course, if we have our first object, a force of 1 newton applied to a mass of 1 kilogram, acceleration is going to be 1 meter per second because 1 divided by 1 is 1. So, it's a fairly simple relationship. So, let's just have a look and a slightly more complex example, we have a bowling ball and we're going to say, for argument's sake, it has a mass of three kilograms. And there are two forces involved, a forward thrust of 22 newtons and friction slowing it down with seven newtons. So a bowling ball with a mass of three kilograms is bowled with a force of 22 newtons. The force of friction is seven newtons. So what is the rate of acceleration? Acceleration is equal to force over mass. The mass is three kilograms, we know this. And the resultant force is 15 newtons, 22 minus seven. So the force is 15 newtons. So in order to calculate the rate of acceleration, we simply divide 15 newtons by three kilograms 15 newtons divided by 3 kilograms gives us 5 meters per second squared. So, in summary, forces act in pairs in opposite directions.
there is an action force and a reaction force. We can represent these with force diagrams. Newton's third law of motion states that every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Force diagrams can contain more than one pair, but they must always be in pairs. The difference in the magnitude of a force in a pair is the resultant force. If resultant forces are zero, then forces are balanced and there are no changes. If resultant forces are greater than zero, then forces are unbalanced and there are changes. Force, mass and acceleration are linked. So Newton's second law is F equals MA force equals mass times acceleration. And we can deduce that for every one Newton that acts on a mass of one kilogram, there'll be a rate of acceleration of one meter per second squared. So I hope you now know a little bit more about forces. I hope you know about Newton's third law and Newton's second law. I hope you know how to calculate resultant forces and I hope you know what happens if you have balanced or unbalanced forces. Until next lesson, keep on learning.